Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to have each and every one of you as our participants for this live webinar. Namaste. Warm greetings from team dentistchannel.online. We hope you all are doing well and are safe. What I quickly want you to do is to introduce yourself in the chat box by telling us your name and the city where you reside. Come on, I want each and every one of you to quickly tell us your name and the city where you reside. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much friends. That shows you all all are set and geared up for a very interesting live webinar. Let's move ahead. Teachers encourage minds to think, hands to create, and hearts to love. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor to have with us Dr. Shankar Ayer as our speaker for this live webinar. I'm sure each and every one of you knows him. Yet, for the ones who don't know him, here's a quick introduction about this personality. Dr. Shankar completed his MDS in prosthodontics from the Government Dental College, Mumbai. He's the director at SMILE, United States of America. He's also the course director of American Academy of Implant Dentistry's MagsiCourse Asia. He's a clinical assistant professor at the Rajas School of Dental Medicine. His practice is limited to prosthodontics and implant dentistry. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Shankar. It's indeed a privilege to have you as an esteemed speaker for this live webinar. I request you to kindly start off with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben, and thanks to Dentist Channel Online for giving this opportunity to share some of our experiences here. What a delight and pleasure it has been to uh, be part of this endeavor. And as you know, we've been conducting over 35 webinars in the past 45 days to overcome the uh, lockdown. And uh, we've been very busy, in fact, trying to educate dentists all over the world to get involved with cutting edge state of the art implant education and also education in oral facial pain. Because to give some brief idea of what we do, We've been running courses in um, UAE, in India, in Philippines, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and all over the United States. So our core um, value is to impart unbiased education. These courses are non-sponsored and are exclusively meant to provide unbiased education. Our maxi courses at Rosemary University is attracted dentists from all over the West Coast and the mountain states. And we also have a program in uh, Abu Dhabi. And this is where our um, Middle East friends get their education. So many of the participants who are in the Middle East have obtained their implant privileges through these courses. And I'm sure many of you are in the audience. Some of my students are uh, registered for this program. And then, uh, it's a uh, warm welcome to all of you to be able to join today's webinar. So the clinical components are, uh, are going to be discussing many of our implant surgical procedures, not just basic implant surgery, but also some of the immediate implant techniques that we will be showing you. Thanks to Nenad Bande, who's the course director in the UAE, and Dr. Syed Khalid and Dr. Varivel Kumar, who have been instrumental in having these courses very busy in India. We also have Dr. Davis Thomas, who is a course director for the Orofacial Pain, very popular program. I invite you to these free webinar sessions on Saturdays. We run at a grand round. So please check us out on our website, smileysa.com, and also smileysacourses.com, and follow us on our Facebook page, Smileysa Center for Reconstructive Dentistry and Smileysa Center for Education Excellence. And we're also planning on launching some of these uh, courses that will deal with aesthetic reconstruction principles. And I'm a uh, faculty at Rutgers University. This is my uh, university where I teach in the Department of Periodontics and Prosthodontics. And I co direct this course with Dr. Uh, Jack Piermardi, who is a board certified prosthodontist. And I'm also delighted to announce the uh, introduction of our uh, maxillofacial program that is with Dr. Varun Acharya, board certified maxillofacial prosthodontist, and Dr. Jacob, who will be instrumental in conceiving this. And uh, stay tuned for the launch of these hands-on courses. 
So here we are with the orofacial pain that has been very successful. We've run about um, six uh, fellowship programs over the past three years. And we've had these graduates uh, go through this program from HN Hospital. And now they're on to a mastership program, which is now a specialty. These are my uh, hands-on courses that I run in New Jersey. We also have extension programs. And of course, the uh, Maxi course has been very popular for the past 17 years. Uh, what an experience it has been. Uh, many of our dentists who have become leaders in the field have graduated up from our program. So this is the latest curriculum that we offer in terms of the oral facial pain. With that infomercial, I want to now begin our lecture for today, which is why immediate placement. Immediate placement has pretty much changed my life for the past 20 years. There was a time when we thought every socket had to be grafted and every single tooth that we extract needs to have a graft. So the advantage of immediate placement is synchronizing the healing of sockets with implant integration. So in other words, which has more blood supply, an extraction socket or a heel bridge? An extraction socket certainly has profuse capillaries that will promote a lot of growth factors. So we want to be able to generate uh, that ability to heal faster because a heel bridge has very little vasculature, whereas an extraction socket has profuse vasculature. So it means you're going to save time, you're going to have better growth factors and better environment. Besides, you're not going back to injure the site again. So more ideal positioning is possible because there's obvious space that's available. It eliminates or minimizes the need for socket grafting. Imagine the expense getting through all of the socket grafting principles. You can extract the socket, place the graft, place the membrane, wait for four months, come back after four months, remove the membrane, now you see soft bone. So it has become unpredictable because dentists don't really look at the bone biology. So I'm gonna dwell over some basic principles of bone biology, which is then going to translate into the rationale as to why we wanna do immediate placements. We also expedite treatment plan because I'm saving four months. So if I'm going to save four months, it's going to be translating into saving cost it also produces more revenue for the operating dentist. Minimizes trauma of secondary osteotomy. Why would you go back and injure a heel site? Because this poor bone is struggling hard to heal. Now you go back and take out four by 10 millimeters of heel bone from that same site that you so painstakingly created to form. So we wanna be able to figure out when is it a good time to do osteotomies and when would be a good time to do socket grafting. It does reduce cost because you're not making the patient spend for additional membranes and grafts. So we created the, uh, uh, the algorithm to do immediate placement. So what are some other disadvantages? Of course, there could be an increased risk of infection if not treated properly. There is always a space between the bone and the, in, uh, the implant. So we need to manage the amount of space that is created from the extraction socket because our implants are not seven millimeters wide, which is the size of the root that you're extracting. And then we need to sometimes do some soft tissue management to be able to cover the implant because if I'm going to place an implant, I want to have a hermetic seal. There's always an increased risk of compromised aesthetic outcomes. And that has caused a lot of these socket shields and soft tissue grafting and bone grafting and so on. So I'm going to show you simple techniques that will not require anything extra. You will not have to do any extra procedures if you follow this algorithm. I want to be able to share 20 years of my results over uh, the presentation. We do need to have additional skill because the drills are going to take you to the path of least resistance. We'll be talking about the implant design. We'll be talking about the specialized drills and how we do a traumatic extraction. It literature is replete with a lot of these um, immediate placement techniques, wherein we have shown that the success rate is very comparable to what we have in a heel bridge. So this is the SCM of an extraction socket. Look how beautifully we can see the lamina dura. For the first time, we've been able to check the inner walls of our extraction socket. This is the first ever published literature on how wound healing takes place. If we don't follow wound healing principles, we have no business getting involved with implants. We should know what happens on day one at the time of extraction, day seven at the time of soft tissue formation, day 14 at the time of osteoid formation, day 28 at the time of 
maturation and all of the good stuff that happens within the expansion socket. So if you don't follow the principles of wound healing, there is no point in using stuff that we think is going to convert into bone. So just look at day one. This is at the time of extraction. Before the extraction, this is the lamina dura. Look how thick and dense that is. You can also see the rich capillary plexus of blood supply, the capillaries that are surrounding the PDL. And that actually is God-given gift for us. And now when we extract the tooth, you can see what happens on the walls. You must have breakdown of the lamina dura to be able to promote a lot of this batch to come in because what is happening inside is all dead bone. You have a piece of clot. So when you have this clot, the clot has no blood supply. The clot has to undergo reorganization. It has to undergo breakdown with fibrinolysin. And then that breakdown product needs to generate some growth factors to be able to resolve the lamina dura and create additional capillaries coming from the side to be able to produce more bone. So we need to understand what exactly is happening that extraction socket so that that extraction socket can be filled with bone and not with mush or soft tissue. People are afraid to fill out to, to have this fear, well, I'm going to extract the sock, extract the tube, and all of a sudden this socket is going to collapse. That's a fear inculcated by people who are selling you bone grafts. We know from the works of Taubman and Atwood that the residual risk resorption is an irreversible, non purposeful, progressive disease process that you have no control over. But we certainly can understand that this process is also manageable and you can minimize the risk of extraction. You and I have seen patients with bone where we have placed implants where there was no history of extraction, no history of bone grafting. You have patients who come to your practice who are 20 years edentulous. You open up the ridge and there is bone to be able to place implants. So how is that bone preserved in some patients and that bone is lost in some of the patients? We should ask that question, not jump into some magical formula that's going to automatically or magically create bone and preserve the bone. So I really question the concept of socket preservation from a preventative perspective. So if socket preservation was a guarantee, then we would not be thinking about socket shield. So let's understand what are the nuances of the extraction socket healing process so we can intelligently create an algorithm that's going to help us create a nice restoration. Patients are coming to us with a trust factor that you are going to provide an implant. So it's up to us how we create this algorithm. That algorithm can be created only if you understand the step-by-step -step principles of wound healing so that you can marry the implant into the socket to provide an ideal emergence profile. So again, not a big fan of uh, uh, socket graft as I told you, because if I can identify the risk factors, I can pretty much control that. Look what happens when we stop the amazing uh, anastomosis that's taking place from the base. This is happening every single day for the past million and a half years, ever since the homo sapiens came into existence. The extraction socket is something that the nature has designed. It is not true that every single extraction socket, you're gonna get soft tissue. Soft tissue will take place if you left behind soft tissue, because the body does not have the cells to resolve the soft tissue. There are no fibroclasts. There are no granulomatous tissue resorbing macrophages. So in the absence of those resorptive cells, your responsibility is to manage that socket in a pristine fashion that every single extraction socket heals with proper post bone. So if this is the anastomosis that you see in a centripetal form of bone healing, imagine if I'm going to put some stuff in here, thinking I'm going to preserve this bone, the body now has to work twice as much. Not only do I have to have the basic um, angiogenesis coming from the side, now I have to recruit monocytes and macrophages to go and resorb the artificial stuff that I put into the socket to undergo resorption. That is why we need to wait four and six months before we can go back and place an implant. So I'm gonna tell you something very easy to follow so that we'll have a methodology for you to to, to execute so you can minimize the risk factors in immediate placement. So you can see two weeks post extraction, what really happens. And there you have your osteoid. 
the osteoid is going to emanate the matrix, which is then going to secrete all of the uh, chondritin sulfate and the ground substance, and then how the osteocytes are entrapped in their own matrix and the whole formation of the sigma cycle of wound healing, everything becomes very, very easy to follow. And then what else do we see? We actually see the osteoid coming from the base. Now, I would rather go in to place the implant at this stage if I'm thinking of a delayed placement. So in my practice, 95% of the time, it is always immediate placement. My socket preservation in the aesthetic zone is less than 5%, right? So what are the indications for immediate placement? Non-restorable teeth, teeth that you don't want to do post eruption or crown lengthening or do a cast post and core and then try to do all the fancy retreatments, which is going to diminish the rate of success for all of these roots. And then some cases where the periodontitis is moderate, still does not have a lot of exudate, it has mobility. This would be an ideal instance for immediate placement. Where else can we do immediate placement? Cases where there is apical transportation, lateral perforation, root canal failures, where the retreatment is not gonna work. You are seeing a draining fistula. These again are going to be sites for immediate placement. What are some of the relative contraindications? Cases where there are advanced periodontitis, but it's going to be very difficult to follow where the soft tissue is going to heal. Look at the crummy soft tissue that is surrounding the, the teeth. You're not going to be able to get primary closure. There is exudate, there is pus, there's all kinds of inflammatory infiltrates surrounding the roots of these teeth. So in the event of extraction, you're going to lose a lot of soft tissue, which is further going to deteriorate the rate of wound healing. So we want to be able to control all of this. When this is possible, we could think of something like this for immediate placement for a full arch restoration. And then you see the number one contraindication is immediate placement with no prosthetic plan. If you are going to place an implant with no prosthetic plan, there is going to be a big problem in terms of how the final restoration is going to be. So if you see a case wherein you're going to be looking at our plane of occlusion, the plane of occlusion is like this. So if you went in blindly and placed implants in this fashion, your final restoration is also going to follow the same type of analysis. So this again is certainly something which we don't want to have with the patient's outcome. The patient's going to be tremendously upset if you're going to have a plane of occlusion, which is going to be zigzag and not have a harmonious relationship. So there again, in the absence of a prosthetic plan, immediate placements do not have a role to play, even for a single two. If you don't know how the final process is going to be, you have no business doing immediate placements. So then you look at multi-rooted situations. What am I going to do? Am I going to use a conical implant? Am I going to use a seven millimeter implant? Am I going to violate the floor of the sinus? If this is the floor of my sinus, what am I going to do? If I'm going to extract this tooth, do I have an implant that's going to be that wide enough? If it is going to be narrower than that, where will I get my primary stability? If I have to go further beyond, will I be violating the sinuses? So you are anatomically trying to compute what would be the best solution for these cases. And also, don't look, listen to companies that will tell you, I can place a 3.3 millimeter implant and that can support a 10 millimeter crown and that is going to be a biomechanical disaster. We want to be able to use an implant that is going to provide the soundest of biomechanical considerations in the presence of available bone and not compromise long-term long -term outcomes. So it is important that we understand the nature of it. It's not so important the timing. Anybody can be skilled enough to place an implant right away, but the real person who is going to be looking at it from a prosthetic perspective is the one who's going to prevail. So you want to have all of your ducks lined up to be able to provide a restoration that is going to satisfy the requirements of function, aesthetics, and biomechanics. So let's look at what else happens. Well, if I have a case like this and I need to do some placements, what are my options? You have options right from mini implants that you can place right in the socket, all the way to implants that can fill up this whole socket. Well, it's a wide variety today. There are more than 250 implant companies, which will give you the product that you're looking for, but don't fall prey to marketing strategy. You are the practitioner, you are the scientist, you are the engineer. You should know what is the best implant for that situation given the patient's criteria, not what's in the draw and not what the company is selling you. 
Okay, there will not be a single mention of any company throughout this presentation. What I want to show you in this one hour is to be able to make you think and analyze and provide customized treatment plan for every patient so that the treatment plan will be commensurate with the kind of disease that the patient presents with. So looking at this case, we certainly can do a wide implant, which is one of my cases I'm showing to you. When rescue implants came in about 15 years ago, I was placing these fat implants. Why? Because it was available. And then we said, we are going to minimize the risk of uh, doing this again. All right. So this could be wide enough. And they always said, diameter is more important. That's going to be robust. And now I can place an implant. Now, if I went to the fattest and the longest implant that there is, and if I have some you know, bone loss, God forbid, there is a problem, I will not have much more of an option to live by. If I do place an implant that is five millimeters, if that play fails, I can go to a six. If that fails, I can go to a seven. But if I go right to seven, just because I want to do an immediate placement, that would be suicidal because we don't have 15 year follow up for many of these large implants because there is a process called as hypofunction. If you don't stimulate the bone enough, that bone will undergo tissue atrophy. So the fatter the implant you are placing, the amount of stresses going into the bone could be minimized and that in turn can cause bone loss. And this is an example of a case that came to me for restoration. Why this implant is very, very popular for immediate placement. Look at where the implant is placed. That is a, an abominable type of placement. You do not want to be in this predicament. My goal is not to teach you immediate placement so you can go ahead and place implants like this. That is an apology for implant dentistry. This is not what the patient contracted you for. The patient contracted, to, contracted us for a successful prosthesis that has a functional support that has no complication in terms of patient comfort. Right. So what are some of the requisites for immediate placement? Some of the requisites are we're going to change the way we practice extraction. You know, when was the last time we changed our elevators? Our elevators have been in existence for years. The elevators bought in 1980 is passed on to our grandchildren. That is, again, something that we should be avoiding. The elevators that are found in the oral surgery department should be condemned. You are not trying to elevate the bone at the adjacent tooth. This is 21st century extraction technique. We should be practicing pristine management of the soft tissue and the alveolus. The alveolus is less than five millimeters, 5.5 millimeters. So if you take your you know, elevator and forceps and use your force to extract the tooth, that can get you an applause from the oral surgeon, but certainly it's not going to save the bone. All right. Our oral surgery department needs to teach you much more of an atraumatic technique. That is what we want to do. We are in the business of preserving tissue. We are not in the business of doing alveolar purchase. Buy the fattest and the most sharpest extraction forceps that you can use so that you can grab the root. And not only are we grabbing the root, we are grabbing the bone. That's what my professors taught me. Something called as alveolar purchase. Just dig into the alveolus, dig into the furcation involvement and rock the head of the patient till that entire tooth along with the alveolus can be removed. Now, how traumatic and cruel that is, All right? So time has come to restructure how we use our instrumentation. Extraction technique is not a two minute procedure. We don't get medals for taking our tooth in a second. Our job is to make sure that every single cell in that PDL is preserved. So we need to be very careful how we extract the tooth, atraumatic extraction techniques, soft tissue management, and if everything else fails, only then we would be doing bone grafts. So we will go through these kinds of uh, choices over the period. All of these instruments is barbaric. These instruments were designed by Pierre Fauchard in 1568. This design has never been changed. Even the Jaipur dentist uses the same exact instrumentation. So what separates Part B dentists from us? All right, just because we have fancy offices. And that's even mentioned in that video that most of you have seen. So it's about time that we looked at how to atraumatically extract the tooth so we can preserve the alveolus and that can create a bed. So the less trauma you inflict into the extraction socket, the lesser grafts you will need for those patients, all right? 
So again, this is another crime that they taught us in oral surgery. You have to squeeze the socket. Squeezing does nothing except produce green stick fractures. The reason for squeezing is to be able to provide a partial denture without undercuts. It's about time we changed how we looked at extraction techniques, and this should be modified. Our textbook should reflect current principles of atraumatic extraction. And this is what we teach in our, in our courses, how to gently remove the tooth so now you have the ambulance and you can go ahead and place the implant right away. The size of the elevators should not be more than 0.5 to one millimeter. What does that mean? After about 10 or 15 extractions, that elevator will be thrown away. We don't hesitate to throw away our files. The files are expensive. The night dive files, we throw away after one use. Why? Because you want to be very careful about the file breaking. So if these elevators start to bend, get rid of it. Do you really need a piezo? You don't need a piezo. Piezo is an adjunct. If you have it, use it. But there's no necessity to go out and buy a piezo just for doing an extraction. All right. So this is the article that I published in Alpha Omega in 2014. We spoke about classification of bone loss and how to atraumatically extract these teeth. So this is available online. I'll be happy to share this article with you. And this talks about a classification that I developed, not based on the fact that you can place a graft or not. This is a very practical classification that tells you what to do. It's not the classification like Kennedy classification tells you class one, two, three, and four, which is not of value from a treatment perspective. Class one, what is class one? Two millimeters of buckle plate. What would I do in class one? I simply close it up. There's no grafting in those cases. Class two, I'm going to see the defect. Buckle plate is one millimeter or less. I would graft the site and do an immediate placement. Class three, no facial plate. Again, I wouldn't be grafting these sites. These sites are inviting me to go and place an implant. And that's exactly how I'm gonna show you how to maximize the benefit of the extraction socket to produce greater healing. Class four, both the buccal and lingual plates are lost. Now that probably is a site I would say, let's do site development. It takes a lot. So class one, class two, class three, I would do immediate placements any day. Class four is the only time I would think of a site development with graft and I will show you examples of each of those cases. Now that's an example of a typical class four where the entire facial plate is locked. That would be a disaster to do an immediate placement because you are simply not going to be able to get primary closure. So you should know what is the mode of approach for these cases. If I looked at the case, am I going to do a lateral pedicle flap and send it to a periodontist? Again, it's not going to work. There is no osseous support and nobody wants a 10 millimeter junction epithelium. And there's hardly any lingual plate either. So these cases would are best treated by extraction and site development. So when we extract, we curate the socket. I'm now going to place some graft. I will place a dual layer membrane, a resorbable membrane followed by a non-resorbable membrane. And then you can see how over a period of time the tissue will heal. Again, not a single millimeter of soft tissue grafting was performed. If you know the physiology of wound healing, if you know what contact guidance is, if you know what contact inhibition is, if you know how the sequence of soft tissue healing will take place, you will get this result every single time. Okay, so this is how you would be performing a site development. And from there on, you can place a uh, implant and get the soft tissue and look at the amount of soft tissue gain. This is a total defect and look at the how implant is actually covered by the soft tissue. So you're now looking at the soft tissue going vertical above and beyond what is there on that lateral incisor. Okay, so we are seeing what else is required for immediate placement. Immediate placement is going to be requiring about three millimeters of apex. The three millimeters of apical bone should be available beyond so that you can get an anchorage. So there you see, you also need spacing between the root and the adjacent uh, tooth. Why? Because when you are placing an implant, there's got to be at least a one millimeter of spacing or the bone to be supporting the blood supply. Okay, so you're seeing all our issues. 
Okay. So you're going to see how this is going to be helping us create the blood supply to support the bone. All right. So let's see how we manage cases with periapic infection. I'll, I'll constantly get this question. What happens there's a periapical lesion? Periapical lesion is not a contraindication. Periapical lesion is actually a granulomatous lesion. We should know what is infected and what is affected. This is the byproduct. The body is having an autoimmune response to a pre-existing toxin. If I culture the periapical granuloma, there will be no bacteria that will be found in that site. If there was bacteria, then you should give the patient antibiotics and it should go away. Granulomas never go away. They are examples of proliferation of chronic inflammatory infiltrate. Okay, so then we raise a flap. We want to make sure that the site is completely clean, pristine. And now once you get a bed that does not bleed, that is completely free and clear of any granulomatous lesion, you can go ahead and place an implant right in that site. There's nothing that should stop you because you've got all the elements of angiogenesis, primary closure, stability, space maintenance, and all of the growth factors that will be present in that socket. So you can go ahead and place implants very easily in these sites. Now, when is it a challenge? If you see the lesion, the lesion is not well circumscribed. If it's well circumscribed, I can take my curette and remove all of this. When it's not well circumscribed and it's kind of diffuse, you should be a little careful about doing an immediate placement here. Why? Because the site has been infiltrated. So this granuloma does not have a definite border. So if you don't have a definite border, you don't know exactly how much to actually go and debride. So we are going to be looking at this site. And this is one of my cases about 22 years ago when I was doing immediate placements. They said, don't raise a flap. Right? If you raise a flap, you will lose bone. So I believed it, didn't, didn't really um, uh, raise a flap. I did it through the socket. And guess what happened? That's what happens. All right? You must be able to visualize every single socket if you have granuloma. You have no business doing a closed debridement and expecting that implant to work. And this is also the reason when you do a closed debridement and you place a graft, the soft tissue is going to infiltrate right into the graft. When you go back to place the implant, the bone graft will be soft, right? In the battle between hard tissue and soft tissue, soft tissue is always going to win. So you're going to see a lot of infiltration of the connective tissue and the granulomatous lesion right into the socket. So we don't want that. And this is also going to tell you how to get your implants in place, whether you want to do screw retain or cement retain. It's not a debate of screw retain or cement retain. Both will work, right? You are going to see how the cement retention is just going to be as predictable as screw retention, all right? So when we place this implant, we want to be placing the implant in this direction, not along the apex. If we go through the apex, it's going to go through the facial plate, and that's probable. So not knowing the anatomy gets us into trouble. And this is the reason why people are doing socket shield. Right? In my practice, if my socket shield is only about 3 or 4% because I have pretty much created the guidelines for me not to have the metal show through. There is stability of the facial plate. And I'll tell you why the facial plate resorbs. The facial plate resorbs because of the lack of understanding of our anatomy and the soft tissue profile. Okay, so this is not what we would be trying to do. So here again, looking at the relationship of the apex of the root and the facial plate, you want to get your implant straight up and down along the parallel aspect of the apex. If you were going, this is screw retention, right? This is how it's going to be a screw retained crown. And so let me get back to our site, All right? So this is our screw retained crown. If I want to have access here, my implant can only go in this direction. So that again is a problem because that will perforate the buccal plate. So the most ideal option would be to do a inclination like this. So if I did this, the only way I can create a crown would be a cement retention crown, all right? And I do about 80% of my cases in the aesthetic zone are cement retention. I'd be willing to challenge anybody in terms of the biology of cement retention, screw retention, uh, because if you are going to aim for screw retention, you need to raise the flap, you have to graft the buckle, 
you have to produce soft tissue grafting in those cases. I rarely do much of a soft tissue in the aesthetic zone because of the fact we are controlling the emergence profile of these cases. Now, looking at this from a uh, practical standpoint, this is the extraction socket. Once you extract, this is how the implant should ideally go. So if we did this, and if my abutment is going to be coming out in this fashion, I can do what's called as an angulated screw access channel. So today we are able to go ahead and place an angulated screw access channel, still maintaining the implant in this direction. So that is solution number one. Solution number one for ideal placement without any kind of fancy technique, place the implant at an angle, use an angulated screw access channel, and make sure that the platform is two millimeters away from the facial plate. That's all that you need. Number two, if you must do a uh, angle like this, there's an implant called a coaxis. That implant already has a natural tilt to it. So the implant, rather than being like this, is like this. So the platform is here, all right? So when you restore the case, you can restore a case, case like this. You can place your implant at 17 or 20 degrees. The abutment platform is going to be at an angle. So because of the angulated axis of the implant itself, you can go right to the screw access channel. So those are the three options that you can consider if you want to maintain proper facial plate thickness, okay? And you'll never have gray shoe on the facial. This is our problem. Trying to get screw retention will get us into trouble because your implant's now going to go right from the palate like this. You think screw retention is better, guess what? We lost the facial plate, all right? So you also cannot bodily push this so far back, right? If you wanna have immediate load, you must be able to get these implants very long. You must get these implants engaged into native bone. You must get these implants far away from the facial plate. So when we do this, this is our problem in terms of gray issue. So what else do we have? You wanna make sure that the facial of this never contacts. The facial of our implant should be far away from the facial of the imaginary line joining the adjacent teeth, all right? So if you miss this, all right, you are going to see the metallic hue. As long as the two bones meet each other, you see a bone here and bone here, if they should talk to each other, you can go ahead and place an implant because as long as they meet each other and the implant diameter is narrower, you can grab the site and you should be able to get these implants well uh, restored. So avoid placing the implant in this place. You never want to place an implant here, all right? Because that's going to result in the facial plate resorption. That's why you place your implant here. And that's also the reason why they're leaving behind the thin shell of the root to call it the socket shield, okay? So unless you know classic immediate placement, don't start socket shield. Socket shield is a slightly more advanced technique. It's work in progress. You have good research coming up. I'm not uh, saying that doesn't work. All I'm saying is that is for practitioners who have excelled in immediate placement, okay? So this is what's gonna happen, right? If you don't follow the principle, look at where these implants are immediate placement to the facial. There's no way you can restore the case. These implants should have been ideally placed here and here. And so that when you restore these cases, they would undergo proper emergence profile. So this is what we are trying to achieve with many of these cases. So I wanna go to a few of these cases in terms of the molars, all right? In the molars, when you have the implant roots going like this, some people say, I want to put my implants parallel to the roots. That's the worst thing you can do. Anatomic parallelism does not equate to implant parallelism. All right, forget about who had taught you that the implant should be parallel to the roots. Implant should never be parallel to the roots. So the way to place an implant, if you are going to extract this tooth, is to first draw the actual tooth. All right, this is my tooth. The patient came to you for a restoration. And which is the best place to support this crown? Would be right here. So forgetting about how the roots are, you want to place the implant irrespective of the trajectory of the roots to get you this proper emergence profile. That's why you need special instrumentation to bypass all of the anatomic concavities and vagaries. So you place your implants exactly where the path of insertion is, and that's how you would restore the case. 
you want to get about 30 newtons of torque when it comes to placement, you want to have good stability. So let's look at some clean aseptic sites. Tooth number eight or one one is going to be extracted. So the tooth has an apical transportation. We are using specialized instrumentation to be able to extract the tooth, understand the soft tissue, make sure the probing depths are fine. Look at every single tissue, it's preserved. No brutal force, no forceps, and no elevators, all with periotomes and luxators. And if you are piezo, you can use it as well. You can see the apex of the, of the root, all right? So you're gonna place your implants right here. Look at this design. I wanna make it screw retained, so place it along this line. You wanna make it cement retained, you can place it along this line. That again is dependent upon how much of facial face thickness there is. So it's not a choice of screw versus cement, it's a choice of what of facial face that there is, and also where you can line this up in terms of your configuration of the uh, implant platform, the diameter of the implant, the location, the three dimensional spatial relationship, the trajectory, all of these will play a role in terms of, uh, look at this, this is a very simple design. Nothing fancy about it. In fact, I'm not even going to talk about platform switch because if you're not getting aesthetics with a regular implant, don't think you're going to get it automatically with the platform switch, okay? So a simple case, two-stage procedure, opening it up, make a provisional, and there you have the final. Look at this. This is a platform match system. There's absolutely no space. And this case is about 14 years old, right? You can see how the soft tissue is going to be held, how the adjacent bone is going to be maintained, and you see the emergence, and that's your stage two technique. Now look at this case. Case is about 20 years old, and this is a very primitive design. Tooth number seven or one two is going to be extracted. We're doing an immediate placement, placement in 1998. We're now in 2020, 22 years ago. This is an external X implant, and as an immediate placement. And look at the pristine soft tissue coverage that I have with no gray issue. All right, so. This is the reason why I question some of the modern advances that are being arbitrarily introduced by companies with no research. In fact, you don't need to even have to produce any research. All they show is one histology or one case presentation, and that's going to be applicable universally. All right, it's not about reports or research, it's about common sense. It's also a report. The, the osteoblasts and the fibroblasts don't have a brain. They didn't go to school to study about the surface of implants. They have no intelligence of their own to know what is the surface of an implant or what implant company it is. All they see is a conducive environment to maintain their normal soft tissue profile. 12 years post-op, this is how I'm seeing my soft tissue here, all right? So this is again the death, I could have told you, this is because of a zirconia apartment. This is because of platform switch. This is because I have a special feature on the surface of the implant. It's got nothing to do with it. You give me a screw, I'll make it work, okay? It's not in the design of the screw. It is not in the platform. It is all your diagnosis. You have to increase your diagnostic acumen to be able to produce results because you're listening to practitioners who are using all different types of implants and they all show outstanding results. What does that tell you? That every system in the world works. It's up to us as to how we should be utilizing these implants. So don't go looking for that magical system, which is supposed to be aesthetically conducive. Here's tooth number one, one. Again, a very old case, more than 12 years, extraction was performed, immediate placement, okay? And then we have a stage two technique, no socket shield, basic stage two. We are creating a provisional for this case, all right? Nothing, nothing here I'm showing you that you cannot do. I have no tricks. I'm not hiding anything. All I'm showing you is basic stuff because I'm really busy doing all my cases. I don't have time to sit and nurse my fibroblast along all of my soft tissue. I don't have the time to sit and educate the osteoblast. This is how you should heal. Okay, I'm doing basic, simple implant dentistry that I learned 30 years ago, and the principles haven't changed much. Okay, aesthetics is a constant. Aesthetics was always there from Prussian Fisher, from Euclid's time for that matter. All right, so we're not automatically bringing aesthetics because we now have better biologics available to us. Again, you, there is not an evidence of a platform switch here. This is a porcelain fused to metal crown. Porcelain fused to metal crown with the titanium abutment, and this is what we are seeing today with the soft tissue aesthetics. Again, benefits of the <laughs> 
someone quickly go through the video for displacement. Okay, look at the technique of placement. The forceps is only for removing the, the provisional. So at no point will I ever use anything heavy. Those are all luxators, atraumatically extracted, osteotomies prepared, and I want to show you how we place the implant. And this is grafting on the facial. The root has been removed in total because why would I want to keep the piece of root which is discolored? See the root. If the root is discolored, I wouldn't want to keep that root for any kind of preservation because I know the adjacent teeth of the bone. If I can graft and place it, then I'm getting primary closure. And then when we see this, you have a better soft tissue profile from these immediate placements. So this again with no flap. This is what I call as a class one extraction socket. All the socket walls are intact, extract, placement, graft, and then closure. You first begin to crawl, then you start to walk, and then you start to run. The same thing is true of immediate placements. Don't ever put anything fancy on these. Do an immediate placement, put a cover screw, close it up, come back. The magic happens at stage two. You've seen people talking about uh, placing a healing abutment. The healing abutment is round, circular. Your teeth have to be triangular. So don't expect a triangular tooth from a round healing abutment. So avoid placing healing abutments at the time of placement is how I would teach all my residents, okay? Do some basic stuff. See how the bone heals. If you don't have 30 newtons of torque, and if you're gonna place the healing abutment, that implant's gonna come out of the patient's mouth, okay? So this again is another design, atraumatic extraction. I don't have PSO because of the cross root proximity, so I'm using a scalpel. The scalpel is acting like my osteotome very carefully severing all the PDL and we can get these roots extracted atraumatically, right? So you go tap, 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 and then take your time. This extraction, there is no medal for early finish. I'm gonna take 30 minutes to take this tooth out. I would rather spend that 30 minutes taking the tooth out than waste four months doing a socket graft because you lost the buckle plate, okay? So I'm going all around except for the facial, mesial, distal, you know, be very careful when you use these uh, scalpers and then use my periotome and then have my implant out. So I'm measuring the length of the tooth. And this implant case, I'm going to be actually placing the implant not too subcrustal. This is another design. And the manufacturer claims, oh, this loves blood. The moment you put this implant on the blood, the blood is going to be sucked along the surface of the implant. And of course it does look sexy and does look convincing. So am I gonna use this as my default? Absolutely not. This is a parallel design. I just want to show you the proof of concept that it's not in the implant that gives you the aesthetics. All right, so there again, you're seeing how this implant is going to be placed, whether you want to place it supracrestal, subcrestal, equicrestal, whether it's going to be placed tightly for the palate. Should I graft it? If I'm going to graft it, what kind of membrane I'm going to use? Am I going to use a resolving membrane, non resolving membrane, non standing membrane, primary closure, razor flap? All these different types of variables will come into your mind, and you are the expert that should know what I should do in this case. This is a case for raising a flap or not raising a flap. So I get a closure. I'm going to get secondary epithelization, and that's a basic uh, porcelain pustin metal restoration. You can see this is a lousy titanium abutment. And what cement is there? Zinc oxide eugenol. That's it. Tempon. Look at the design. It's sandblasted. It's got a groove on the lingual. It's circumferential. I have cement. Do you see any inflammation? Because the cement does not travel beyond the tissue. All I use is a crop of cement, that's it. And this is a five-year follow-up. And what do you see? You see more soft tissue on the implant than you see on the adjacent tooth, all right? No platform switch, just routine placement. And this patient is now very adamant. She says, not only do I want an implant, I also want a tooth at the same time, all right? The best option is not to touch the tooth. But now you're living in the world of digital age, in the world of Google, everybody Googles and says and looks at immediate load. You are an implant expert. I can do teeth in a day, teeth in an hour, teeth right away. Okay, so patients are coming to us with all these kinds of demands. And, you know, you should be equipped to handle cases like this. This was a case I did in 2006, 14 years ago. Atraumatic extraction, and I have the root removed. Okay, so I'm going to take this slightly off. I have the root removed carefully extracting the tooth, and then I'm measuring the length of the tooth, measuring the diameter of the tooth. I would choose the diameter about 30% from the apex of the tooth, of the root, and then I'm 
choosing a design and making sure the entire patient wall is intact. Again, a class one extraction defect. Uh, we can also see the implant design. This is now a scallop design. The scallop design is going to be placed supracrystal, right? You would laugh at me if I showed this case as a technique for placement because all along we've been told place the implant two millimeters subcrystal. Yes, that is the norm. You want to place your implants two millimeters subcrystal. Now, what I see here is the implant placed equicrystal. What you see there is the is the lip of the inner proximal. The mesial and distal is in line with the CDJ. I'm also doing a immediate provisional. The immediate provisional needs to be narrow. Why does it have to be narrow? Because you're integrating the soft tissue going to the embrasure area. And as it's narrow, you're also going to fashion this over a period of time. So when you get this nice sulcus, you want to be able to capture the emergence profile with a custom medium abutment. All right. So the custom medium abutment is now a provisional and transferring the information of the custom provisional on the master model. So the laboratory now knows exactly how the sulcus is being fashioned by the provisional so they can give you an exact replica of what is there in the sulcus. The sulcus is being captured. The sulcus information is now transferred to the laboratory so they can now build the porcelain exactly like the way you have sculpted it. So there's no blanching involved. So you can reproduce a single tooth aesthetic exactly now how the previous case was. So this is level two. Not only am I doing an immediate placement, we are now placing an abutment and a restoration at the same time. All right. So this is 2017. And this is how okay. we are seeing the case progress. So this is another case where the root is um, submerged. We're opening up a flap. I'm a fan of opening a flap. I don't do flapless. Remove the root. You can see the amount of space between the implant and the and the um, uh, bone wrap. Okay. So there we have our uh, implant placed. You can see the gap junction. This is type two defect. Facial plate is one millimeter thick. The thinner the facial plate, the more palatal the implant should be. Now you're grappling the site. Okay. We grab the site. You will see that there's absolutely no real um, uh, uh, bone that has not been covered. So all of the grafted bone will turn over and I'm making a provisional at the same time. So this is a screw retained provisional that we are fabricating and that screw retained provisional is going to now create the soft tissue profile. Look at this, I do a proper stage to raise the flap. I wanna create that papilla to grow in between. So I'm also creating a custom impression coping and fashioning the tissue and there we have our final restoration. Here in this case, it's slightly more complicated. Tooth number nine, tooth number 10, tooth number, number nine, number two one, has a case of an internal resorption. The tooth is hopeless. You want to extract the tooth. You think there'll be any facial plate? Absolutely no facial plate. Curettin to the socket. You want to make sure that all of the granulation tissue is removed. Now, I'm not raising a flap, so I'm using Dennis Darnoff's technique of the ice cream cone by creating a barrier on the facial that is going to now supplement the lost facial plate. And now we need to add some bone graft like beneath the, um, the, the, the membrane. And then I'm also placing the implant at the same time, making sure that, look at the gap junction. Kill two to three millimeters of space, right? There was no facial plate. So if I can make this work, I could pretty much do anything under the sun because your goal is to understand bone biology. Your goal is to understand soft tissue healing, wound healing, contact guidance, all of the phenomena responsible for soft tissue healing and heart tissue osteogenesis. Okay, if you can do that, you can pretty much manage every single case. So now I come back at stage two, we do a provisional for this case. And there you can see the abutment. Every single case I'm showing you is a porcelain fused to metal restoration. Okay, if I can succeed with the PFM, it certainly is going to be better with the all ceramic. The problem with the all ceramic is you're going to cement it with resin cement. And if you cement it with resin cement, God forbid the screw comes loose, you're going to have to drill it out. Okay, so thank God I don't have all of these issues. Another case, now the case is a little different. I do have a fistula. What do I do? Which means now you think I have to raise a flap? Absolutely. This is a case of a flap that I'm going to raise. Am I worried about the papilla being lost? I will not be. I'm going to make my incision on the keratinized tissue. So don't hesitate. You can see the horizontal fracture. This is my radiograph that I'm showing. You must always have bone slightly palatal to the apex. This is where your bone should be, right? So where am I? Okay. this is where my bone got to be. So this is where I'm going to place my implant. You can see how thin the facial plate is. 
for proponents of uh, uh, of, of um, uh, socket sheet will say, oh, this is a great case, you can save the socket, but not with the fistula. With that fistula, I want to get to the fistula. It's not a good case for socket shield, okay? That's a contraindication, in fact. So what we would do is raise a flap. You can see how I don't hesitate to raise a flap. I want to get to this, all right? Then get to this, debride it. This is a type three defect for my classification, all right? Type three defect. Where's my osteotomy? Slightly palatal, which is a completely new osteotomy. This is the apex of the tooth. This is the osteotomy I'm preparing. And the diameter of the implant, 56, 70% of my implant is exposed, right? 70% of them. How can I make this work? As long as I keep it within the end case area of available bone, I should have good bone support. Augmentation, place my PRF, getting my closure, and then we come back. Look at that, that's crummy. Now you would say, well, do I need to do a soft tissue graft? Well, if you can manage a proper stage two, you probably will not need a soft tissue graft. Oh my God, what do I do with the black triangle? It's supposed to be a major disease entity all over the world. But that's still not a black triangle. That is guided papillary growth. You are now going to train the soft tissue to grow into that embrace area with the contours of a provisional. If the interproximal bone is pristine, this is what I'm looking at. As long as I have bone here and here, I never have to worry about a black triangle. Black triangle will only happen if the bone level is like this. And if you have, you know, if you don't have bone up to this point, then you worry about it. In this case, I'm not worried about it at all. I'm happy to go and raise the flap. So this is going to slowly fill in through guided papillary regeneration. So this is again an art, which means you're not, this is not a surgical skill. Surgical skill is easy. This is prosthetic skill, restoratively. How am I going to train this case? This cannot happen with a 3D printed model. This is something you're gonna visualize and see where the soft tissue is in and modify it, okay? These are analog principles. I know there's a lot of 3D printed techniques that are available. This is simply not achievable because of the fact that you are placing the soft tissue around it. And now look at the emergence profile of the case. And if this is a titanium abutment, soft tissue profile, and we can get the final restoration completed. So when you have the disease process go beyond the apex in another case, I have no other option except to remove all of the, uh, I'm gonna take this like the other way. All right, so I'm gonna extract the roots. I'm gonna show you what I do for a provision made from a basic. Okay, so this is my provisional abutment. Okay. And then I'm going to do a cementable provision. Okay, so we're not doing a stupid provision because the implant's sticking out. I just trim this up. And this is how I will make my provision. Chair side provision, trim this up, make sure it's nice and concave. All right, check the bite. And look at the facial soft tissue, it's really crummy. So fine tune your prosthetic skills and look at the concavity. The concavity that you see here is what is there in the natural teeth. This, a digital scan will not reproduce. I can tell you right away. The digital scans will not tell you this concavity. So your crowns are gonna come bulky and out and that's when you get into a, a, a recession. You'll never have a recession if you go do it this way. Okay, open the flap. I'm gonna switch this up. And then you see about four weeks later, this is immediate placement, immediate load. All right, and then you see a custom impression coping, and there you have your soft tissue moulage, and then you can trim this up, and this is where we started, okay? This is another case where you have the uh, sequestrum that is showing through, and then we extract the tooth, and you can see there's no facial plate. When there's no facial plate, you think you would, this is a good case for graft. I mean, if you're getting started with the immediate placement, I would say, don't do this just to a block graft or a tenting screw, but I'm showing you what it will take. Understanding the implant design. This is an aggressive design, all right? This aggressive design will not grab the apex. So you need to go with a more subtle design. Only the apical two or three millimeters is engaging. The rest of the implant is in air. So we graft the site. As long as you get your membranes in order, okay? 
you get your stage two provisional, and then you get your final crown, all right? So then when we see these cases extend beyond, this is again, it, I can show you the extent to which you can do immediate placement. This is an extreme case. Tooth number one one is fractured, and you can see the uh, uh, cross section of the fractured tooth, no facial plate, right? You would be crazy to do immediate placement here, right? Because there's no facial plate, there's no apex to speak of, all right? Then after extraction, you can see how much of defect there is. I'm gonna curate the entire socket. Uh, a sense, I mean, it would not be wrong if you went and grabbed the side. That is the incisive nerve that I'm showing, okay? So this is the needle that's going through the incisive canal. So with respect of that, this is now what is called as a type four defect. Normally you should be grafting the site. I'm showing you even a type four, uh, how you can get your ball graft placed. I'm also placing the implant, PRF, close it up. And at stage two, you can see that this entire bone is covered. You can't even see the implant. That's true osseoconduction and the graft, you know, we should know the, quant the consistency of the graft, the quality of the graft, and then you get your final crown. So we are now, I mean, when would I not do any placement? This is a case I would not do a placement, okay? So this is, in an average, if, if I look at 100 cases, maybe three or four cases will come like this. And these cases have a very large defect. Tooth number eight is pretty much shot. Um, you can see almost to the apex, the cone beam shows bone loss to the apex. No parietal plate, no buccal plate. So I'm now extracting number one, one, curating all the granuloma. And then what you're seeing is no lingual plate, no facial plate. It's a thin bridge. There's no really room to engage the implant whatsoever. So you want to prevent the soft tissue from coming into the graft. So I'm placing a membrane on the palate, some kind of uh, particular graft. And then I'm affixing a block graft, which is going to go in like a sandwich, PRF membrane. We close this up. All right. Four months post op, look at the vertical bone growth that we got. All right. So this is, and then when you drill, the graft should heal, should bleed. That's a true marker of osseous remodeling. All right. So there you can see three millimeters of bone on the facial. All right. That's the benefit. There's absolutely no bone. With the graph, you can see a contiguous bone growth at all times. And this again is an example of bone biology. There's nothing skilled about it, okay? There are probably a thousand more people more skilled than I am. Many of you have done some exotic stuff, but all I'm showing you here is how knowledge of biology, knowledge of prosthetics, and when you integrate them, it'll come to your benefit, okay? These are very simple samples I'm showing you. And I think I am overshooting my time. It's already 1034. Um, would uh, open up the floor to questions if you guys have. Am I uh, good with time? I think I had about an hour. It's exactly an hour and four minutes. So if there are any questions, I would be glad to answer them. If not, I will conclude this presentation. Your opinion on magnetic mallet for a traumatic extraction? No, magnetic mallet will not give you blows that will be kind of, uh, of, of control, okay? Magnetic mallet I would do for a wisdom tooth or for a molar. So there is no question for a mallet for even osteotomes for that. Dr. Shankar? In case. And we undergo bone grafting and then implant fixation section of the I think I just showed you how it's done. Uh, bone loss acceptable. Clinically, I mean, it depends on how you would consider bone loss. I mean, bone loss is a progressive process. If you have a one millimeter of bone, you would do a block graft and then, you know, that is a site development case. Uh, Dr. Shankar? If we go wrong with the angulation, can be managed? Yes, you can do manage, but if you go wrong extremely beyond about 20 degrees, then you're looking at a soft tissue management or even taking the implant out. Yes, Ruben, were you talking to me? Sorry to disturb you, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we could probably give our participants about two minutes of their time so that they can uh, note down their questions. Okay, I have a few questions that are uh, being posted, so I'm answering those. Please, please, sir. Yeah. 
So how much discrepancy of gap is acceptable between the implant and bone? We should go for grafting. I would say graft every single site. The Tana used to say two millimeters. I disagree. You should graft. Whenever you see a space, graft it because bone is osteoconductive, but you need a scaffold. You need something where it can march past. So I would say graft every single site. Um, which types of implants should be used in typical case in jail recession, partially in this jaw, mandibular dysostosis? I really don't understand this question. Mandibular dysostosis. Well, in the case of recession, I would use a polish collar mostly because a polish collar is kinder to recession. Uh, you should also think about site development. If you have bone loss, that's going to be further down. You should always think about uh, doing it in two stage. So recession can be controlled by doing it in two stage and soft tissue grafting. When doing the ice cream technique, where do you tuck the membrane inside the, yes, it's inside the facial plate. You're not raising a flap. The, the ice cream cone technique actually is like this. So when we, I don't know if you can still see my screen. So if you have a facial plate lost like this, and this is your soft tissue that's around. Okay, this is the soft tissue around your ice cream cone is going to go like this into, and then it goes over like that, okay? So it's not, you're not raising a flap and putting it outside. So this is a membrane that we're using, all right? Is it mandatory to check the bone density level before implant fixation? Not quite. If the bone density level is only a relative density, don't get fooled by bone density from a CT scan. Bone density is only relative bone density. What you see as ounce field in it is not bone density. It's relative grayness of the bone. Real bone density can only be checked with the DEXA scan. So when you see a ounce field units, it is only an indication of what is the opacity that is present. But you can have a 700 ounce field units and it can be all soft tissue. Why? Because your graft, if it is not incorporated, let's say use BIOS, or something that is dense, you can pack it. It is going to be giving you a thousand Hansfield units for the next 10 years. But if it's not incorporated, there's no point, okay? Uh, how long does it take to resolve surgical area of imposition of implants? So if, typical, same time, three to four months. In the last case is a block graft, we use Rocky Mountain uh, allergenic bone graft. Implants placed in elderly patient, a sinus disorder that again is not an immediate placement case. I would suggest that you, uh, you attend one of our webinars. It is beyond the scope of this particular lecture. Uh, incisive canal, what you can actually take the whole incisive canal out. You can strip the incisive canal, you can cure the incisive canal, you can block the incisive canal. Incisive canal is really of no consequence. It's purely a vestigial organ. It's mostly lymphatics. Very few nerves are there. Even if you take this off, there will be no paresthesia. Guaranteed. Uh, membrane and PRF, okay. How do you decide between membrane and PRF? Well, if you want something to really last, then use a membrane. PRF is an adjunct. PRF exposed is going to be washed out. So I do do PRF, but I would do PRF and then place a membrane on top of it. It depends on what is the type of surgical procedure you're going to do. If I'm going to do a block graph, I'm not relying entirely on the growth factors. I want to have a physical barrier that's going to prevent the ingress of any of the extraneous material from affecting the socket or the graph. The graph needs to be pristine. You need to have primary closure. You need to have space maintenance, primary fixation, stability, angiogenesis. If you don't have those factors, PRF is not going to do anything, okay? So use PRF in a way that it's going to help you with your soft tissue healing. It has zero effect on bone growth. Which bone graft did you use for the last case? Okay, that's fine. Granuloma from the neighboring tooth implants. The last case, well, you have done an epicectomy. So this case was treated with epicoectomy, okay? So we want to do an epi You can see how it's cut off. Epicoectomy, retrograde filling, and that's so you have complete bone fill for this case. Best graft, it depends on, this, on, the, on, the, on the purpose of the graft. So I would be lying to you if I told you what's the best graft. I don't use synthetics, period. Synthetics are purely space fillers. If I want something to be a pontic space, I would use synthetics. If I want something to last a long time, um, if I want radio opacity, then it's okay. But 100% pure synthetic does not really convert into bone that's gonna give you the same level of bleeding. What's your marker? You take your graft, fill it up with synthetics, 
come back in four months, drill that right into the graft. If you're going to get bleeding, then I will tell you that bone works. I've not been able to see one graft material that does not come out during osteotomy preparation. Does it mean that you cannot use it? You can use it. I'm not saying it doesn't work. All I'm, all I'm saying is if you want bone 100%, if you took a core biopsy, even with bios, you're seeing islands of bone, of graft, still remaining in bone. So if the quantity of the graft is more than the quantity of the host bone, then we're in trouble because bone will not undergo remodeling. The implant that we place in a bone should undergo remodeling. Inter implant distance is about three millimeters in every case, not two millimeters. Method to fabricate chair site provisional would be to actually spend time. Um, you, could you do digital? You can do digital, but trust me, you're gonna spend a lot more with digital. Digital is taking into consideration that your depth of placement is all gonna be fine. Depth of placement is not gonna be fine. What if you didn't get the torque? You would place your implant two millimeters deeper, which means the prefabricated abutment that you had will no longer fit. So forget about digital at this point. If you have millions of dollars to invest and you have 10 people working for you to do the design, I'm say, I would say go ahead and do it. Till such time, believe in your two hands and believe in your prosthetic skills because that's what's going to be training the digital guy to design how you should be doing the case. What's the best method? Uh, Mansoor, I, we will talk about this in the maxi course. I will go through this step by step. I know you're going to be placing implants in a couple of months. I'll work with you on a case to show you exactly how we should be doing a provisional. Um, what else do I have? What is the approximate time taken for bone generation? It depends on the type of graft. If you're using cortical bone, it might take five months. If you're using cancellous bone, it'd be a little faster. If it's a cortical cancellous mix, you need about one sigma cycle. And one sigma cycle is about anywhere between 17 weeks to 21 weeks. So that's how we typically see bone growth take over. And that's how you would know exactly if the bone is ready for your implant placement. Talk required for immediate temporary crown should be at least 30 to 50. How would you know that? You would use your motor. You know, if your final torque is about 30 newtons, you can use your ISQ. If you have the ISQ, you can use it as a guide. But typically, if you have a good torque and you know that you are in about 70% of the host bone, that's very important in your placement. Uh, in a multi rooted tube, again, you can section it, see where the fulcation is, you can place it right in the middle. And again, if you don't have the ability to place the implant right away, don't place it. All right. There is no necessity or there is no requirement that you have to place implants in every single extraction socket. What I meant was in the aesthetic zone, you can do this 90% of the time is what I'm trying to tell you. Posteriorly, would I do it? I would do it if I have the trifurcation and you can have the implant placed right in the middle. I really wish we had more time to discuss uh, Vertical bone growth, again, this could be part of your tenting screws. You can do vertical growth. Uh, why grafting is not required in shock and shield? Because you could do grafts and, I mean, that's a mistake. You still have to graft in a socket shield. Nobody says you should not graft, okay? In a socket shield, if you're trying to place the graft and if you're trying to place your implant, the graft is gonna push on the shield and it might cause a green stick fracture, okay? The less amount of pressure you have on that on that wall, the greater success you're going to get, okay? I mean, it's too difficult to teach you everything in that one hour. This is basically to kindle your senses and to make you think and to be able to plan your cases for the future. For those of you planning to get involved, these are some of the things you should be considering in a teaching program, all right? Go with a program that is backed by academy, backed by an institution. For heaven's sake, do not take these free courses that they will fly you to some country and then you learn a course. You will get tunnel vision. Implantology is not system driven. Implantology is a science. You should know about the biology, you know about engineering principles. Okay. So invest some money in education and something that comes for free, it'll be worth nothing. Okay. So please be diligent in how you learn these techniques because these are irreversible procedures that you'll be performing on your patients. All right. Okay, Ruben, I think we have uh, overshot by 15 minutes. I really want to thank you for all your participation. It's been uh, wonderful interacting with you. Uh, I hope you got something out of it and uh, hope to catch up with you on our webinars. Check us out at uh, smileysa.com. Uh, we do have webinars being uh, posted on a weekly basis. And thanks to Dentist Channel Online, they were kind enough to tell me that uh, 
Uh, this would be a forum to kind of and let you know what else is going on, what else is happening around the world, and be part of an international organization that's going to give you some credibility and validity to what you do. And uh, wish you very well. You're going to be opening up your practices very soon. Stay healthy. And please don't go buying out stuff because of marketing. Again, that's a whole new thing that's happening with the PPE. We are planning to host a webinar on PPE and how to open your practices during this COVID period. So stay tuned. I will be doing a live one-on-one -on -one discussion of the different gadgets that are there. What are the myths? How to dispel the myths? How to protect your staff? How to protect yourself? And how to protect your patients? And how you should keep your office ready for... Uh, the, for, for the time when the floodgates open and how you should be uh, maintaining uh, good protocols so that uh, we all can practice uh, uh, safely and be ready for the next wave of a pandemic. If it ever happens, that should not something which should be a showstopper. Thank you, Dr. Shankar Ayer. Thank you for love. Thank you so much for the lovely presentation and for the fantastic cases that you presented. Uh, please allow me uh, to present a short uh, uh, PPT of dentistchannel.online. It would just take about two minutes of your time. Could you please stop your screen share for a moment, sir? I will. And I'm going to sign off to. Dear friends, once again, it's an absolute pleasure to have you as our esteemed participants for this webinar. I'm sure you all all loved this session. If you all did, and most of you all have already mentioned that it was a wonderful session. For the ones who have not, I request you to come on. Kindly put at least one adjective saying it was fantastic, it was wonderful, it was awesome. You can say anything that you feel made you learn something. Come on, that's Dentist Channel Online's motto. And our motto is to only keep continuing, keep giving you continuous dental education. That's dentistchannel.online for you. Uh, friends, dentistchannel.online is a dental media company uh, catering exclusively to the dental fraternity. I request you to kindly, kindly subscribe and follow dentistchannel.online's YouTube page, Instagram page, and other social media pages so that you get to know what's happening around the world when it comes to dentistry. Please do visit our page. That's www.dentistchannel.online. I'm sure there might be something of your interest. There might be some scientific articles, blogs that you would love to read and like you would love to know more uh, when it comes to your particular interest. Please do uh, visit www.dentistchannel.online. Friends, here's our social media pages once again. It's a gentle request. If you could follow our, our social media pages, you would be staying in touch with us and you would get to know what's happening around the world when it comes to dentistry. An e-certificate of participation would be given to you if you're a DCO Prime member. I request you to kindly become a DCO Prime member so that you can avail exclusive benefits when it comes to masterclass sessions, workshops, courses, et cetera, that we've planned for you all around the year. I request you to kindly become a DCO Prime member to know more about DCO Prime membership. You can message on the below mentioned WhatsApp number. Once again, thank you very much from the entire team to Dr. Shankar Ayer for the lovely presentation. You're very welcome, Ruben. Thanks again for hosting us. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you very much. May you all have a good day. To know more, get in touch with dentistchannel.online and I request you to kindly be a DCO Prime member.